So far we've got the HTML portion of the project, some input fields. We need to then now capture what has been typed into those fields and then process them, process that info, and then eventually store it in the database. We have the ability to read what's in these fields and then store to a database. So that's going to require uh, a lot of JavaScript. In our code, I've got line 27 and 28. Yours might not line up, but whatever numbers they're at. We've got the script tags that point to the two libraries. After those, before the end of body, let's add another script block, this time as a pair, separated like that. We're going to keep this all very simple and write our JavaScript in this file. We could, of course, and we should, write it in a separate file so that it can be used more efficiently. But once we transfer this over back to the CBDB project, we'll just copy and paste this script into index.js eventually. So we're putting it in this order because it matters. Load the basic jQuery library. Well, it's basic nowadays, but back in the day this was revolutionary. And then load the PouchDB library so we can do this database stuff. And then we'll write our all, all of our custom JavaScript code to do something. We're going to start off with first the uh, traditional immediately invoked function expression. This will uh, make our code more efficient and other, other reasons. Remember, we've got opening and close parentheses, opening and close parentheses, semicolon. Inside of the first parentheses, we'll write function with its own parentheses and its own curly braces. This is the immediately invoked function expression. We're going to create a function at this point. All of the code that we're going to write will exist in this function, and this code will be processed faster. This code will, uh, you know, the namespace with variables and such will be more efficient. It's just that this is the syntax. And we got this automatically uh, in Visual Studio. In Visual Studio, it wrote it for us, but here we have to write it manually. So then I'm going to break the curly braces. I'm going to move these curly braces, break them right here, and all of our code is going to go in between. So break that. And then we'll activate use strict. Strict mode. I want uh, more feedback from the browser. I want the browser to process the code stricter. I want more errors. There are examples of silent errors that the browser will never tell you there's a problem. But with strict mode it will. So we're activating strict mode of JavaScript processing. Last time we wrote JavaScript um, for the Visual Studio project, I believe, we wrote uh, our code in the different blocks or areas, uh, a, a, an area setting up variables or objects, an area setting up or a section setting up functions, and then a section setting up event listeners. So we're going to follow that convention. Often it's best to uh, define our variables early on, our objects, so we'll create some variables here. We're going to use jQuery mobile, so we'll start with the, I mean jQuery, so we'll start with the dollar $L element form save comic equal to the jQuery selector, and that's equivalent to document dot get element by ID quotes, but the thing you have to remember is to include the, the pound sign in the selector form say comic so we're creating a jQuery based variable using the jQuery selector to find 
in instance of an ID form, say, comic, which should be the same as your form right up there. Form ID equals form save comic. We're going to set up more than one variable here. So uh, I didn't put a semicolon. We're not done yet. We're going to do a little bit more. Yes, I, I did say that a moment ago. We're writing it in the file right now for simplicity. And then later, when we get it back into our Visual Studio project, we will move this to the index.js file. <coughs> so we're creating this, uh, this first um, object, um, comma, db, semicolon. Now this one is not a um, jQuery-based variable. It's a plain old JavaScript variable. And I'm not setting it to anything at the moment of creating it. Sometimes you do this if you want to do other things. Right now, we're up here I'm creating a variable and setting it to something. I'm not going to set it to anything yet because that's the variable that's going to hold our database, basically. And we saw in the pouch website, var db equals new pouch. And that'll work. But looking ahead, what that documentation didn't tell you is there is an instance, a use case, where the person wants to start over. They have the app installed, they want to start over. They were playing with it. They, they, they want to delete all the comics and start over. I was just checking it out. So eventually we're going to set up code to delete the database, to delete everything in the database. We then need to re-establish the database. So through the years of teaching this class, this is a way that will help us do that easier than other ways. We're going to create the database, but we're actually not going to set the database up yet. We're just creating the variable for it. So we can write a comment here, set up database, so we'll say set up database variable, but don't um, connect, quote, connect it, connect with pouch db yet. so that we can set up a, a way to create uh, the database uh, quickly. If we do db equals new pouch db right now, that I found limits us in the future. So that's why it looks like that. Not really set to anything. Next line. So forget to end that semicolon there. Next line, we'll create a function called initDB, initialize database. <coughs> so we want to first create the database variable globally. We want to be able to reference the database anywhere in our code. So it's outside of a function, except the immediately invoked function, that's a special case. So we've got this variable that can be used all over our code. Because if you ever create a, a variable inside of a function, this variable can only be used in this function. Don't write this. but thing, that variable can only be used in this function. It has a scope. It only exists basically in this function. So if we did var db equals new pouch in this function, it would only really exist in this function. We created the variable of database outside in the global scope so that it can be used throughout the whole project. In this initialization function, we'll set it to db equals new pouch db. 
because we have a connection to the pouch file, this is valid. Without that pouch.js file, if we try to do new pouchdb, it will say, I don't know what pouchdb is. Because we're connected to the pouch file, we can create a new pouchdb instance of a database and store it in this variable. The documentation says, okay, we need an internal name, a name that the user never sees, which can be called anything like kitty cat. Or how about we name it something meaningful like my comics. The user will never see this. You will see this in the console output if you choose. You will see this in the developer's panel if you choose. The user will never see this. So here now we have a way to initialize a database more dynamically whenever we want than this. If we had written it up here, it would have initialized one time. The first time that the program loads, I want a way to be able to initialize a database whenever I need it. Next line, return the database object back out to the rest of the world of the project. So notes, function to initialize the database, create a new instance of the pouch db object, the database, return the object to the global scope. Function to initialize the database whenever we need it. That sets up a function to be able to initialize a database whenever we need it. The database has not been initialized because that function has never been run. Let's run the function. And then, now we can start using db.something, db.put, db.get, db.info. I want to show the database info in the console. So we've got a function that will let us initialize a database, a database ready to start to save data. We actually then initialize it, activate the database to start using the data. So initialize that database. And then console output, uh, show the database. Save it and run it. Um, F12 to see your console output. It will probably look some, like some weird output, but it should give you some result. I think I've also seen, depending on the version of Firefox, uh, it may want to cooperate or not. So if it looks kind of weird in Firefox, check it in Chrome. Let me let me check it on both. I'm going to run it on Firefox first. F12 console. Um, okay, that looks fine. Promise state fulfilled value object. Okay, I guess that's fine. I'm going to run it in uh, Chrome. Chrome will give me console promise and it says stuff inside of it. Resolved. So again, it's not that uh, nice looking for people.
um, but this uh, this creates a database. If you get a weird error about something like uh, <laughs> failed to load resource, that most likely will be you've mistyped your link over to your JavaScript libraries. Make sure your address is the same. I'll check you in a moment. But other possible errors could be uncaught reference. If it says uncaught reference of PouchDB is not defined, that means you didn't write your PouchDB JavaScript library link. It doesn't know what PouchDB is. Let's pause there. Did anyone get any weird errors? Unsupported character. That has to do most likely with your UTF-8 character up here. Let's take a quick look.
All right, so this uh, initialization of the database uh, is, is very useful to pause for a moment. If I look at it in, in Firefox, uh, my console output says a, a certain kind of thing. If I look at it also in Chrome, it looks a little bit different. Now, in, it, let's look at this in Chrome at the moment. If you run it in Chrome and you see that it says promise, um, this says, okay, something happened. Uh, we created something. Now in Chrome, another screen to see where your database is, is the same screen where we were storing our local host cookies. Remember that a while ago? The, the local host object, uh, local storage, the local storage object that was saving the login system. In Chrome, we can see it by going to the application tab 
of the developer's console. Remember, we have local storage. But now we're going to see our PouchDB database inside of the IndexDB group. This is in Chrome. We'll see how that looks like in Firefox in a moment. But IndexDB, if you open that up, Pouch My Comics, the name of the database you created will, sh will show up there. And then inside of that, you can see your data in a variety of ways. For example, by sequence. I've already stored some stuff in my database, so I see stuff. I'm going to delete this in a moment. You probably will see nothing because you haven't saved anything to the database. In Firefox, if you want to see how that looks like in Firefox, the default tabs in Firefox don't have like a databases tab. In Firefox, you have to be in the console. Then you open up the options of the console. Then you say, also show me the storage tab. So now you get a new storage tab. This is in Firefox. And I've got an index DB inside of that, a pouch <coughs> database. So different ways to look at your data. I have stuff in there that I want to get rid of, so let me just um, get rid of that. <coughs> Don't worry about this at the moment, we'll do it later. Okay, so what we've done then is created a database, uh, instantiated, put some console output. We can comment that out. We can kind of verify, yeah, we get a database. I don't need to constantly see that in my output, so I'll just comment it out. Okay, what we need to do is read the information that the person typed into the, uh, into the fields. So on the next line, we're going to create a function called fn prep comic. A function that will prepare the um, data input into those fields. We'll have a function to read the data, to prepare the data. We'll have another function to save the data. We'll have another function to read the data from the database. We'll have another function to update the data, and so forth. So I'm going to do something there in a moment. Let's just do a console log. Getting the data from the fields, the input fields. function to prepare to get the data from the fields and prepare <coughs> to be saved to pouch TV. All right, so that function is going to do its thing once we click Submit. So we need to set up an event handler on the event of a submit. Run that function. So after the function, we'll set up our event handler. Uh, L form save comic. Because we created up here. 
the uh, object dot submit on the event of a submit. There's a form with that ID. Once the person clicks submit, do the following. Run that function. So we're going to then say function, parentheses, curly brace. Once we click submit upon a function, let's run a function. Uh, once we click submit upon a form, let's run a function. Now the default behavior of submitting uh, forms on a usual website is that the screen reloads to go off somewhere else to process the data on a traditional web browser. This is the same sort of issue we had when we were doing the login system. Well, we weren't running that login system inside of a server, we were running it in an app. So we have to override the default behavior. It's not running on a server, we need to change the behavior of how submittal works. So an event has happened from trying to submit it, but it's the event of, we're on a server. No, we're not on a server. So this function is going to deal with the event object and pass it into our function prep comic function parentheses event. Submit usually causes an event. We need to deal with this event in this function. So before we do the console log, we will say event dot prevent default. Don't refresh the screen. Don't go to some other screen. We're not on a web server. Don't do the, the default um, behavior. Stop the default behavior. Prevent the default behavior. Of submitting a form. Like, don't refresh. have here a comment um, event handler for a submittal and capture the, uh, the event to prevent it. To prevent default. So if you save it and run it, you try to submit that form, of course it'll ask for a couple of required fields. But if you fill in the form with the required fields and click Submit in your console, you should get the message, getting the data. Mine works. So again, if I just simply try to save, it'll say fill out the fields, just fill in whatever for the moment. Getting the, getting the fields. So the form doesn't clear, doesn't save to the database yet. I'm just confirming that clicking the button will do something. So you should see then the output, console output, and we should see it should recognize if you don't fill anything in. Now obviously for beta testing it's annoying to have to fill those in. For beta testing you could remove the required attribute of the title and the number. For just some quick testing without having to always type something into the title and number, remove the required attribute. I'm not going to because I'm probably going to forget to put it back in later, but one way to quick test it quicker, remove the required attribute of those inputs. Here's another one that we maybe don't really need to 
keep announcing that it's working, so I'm going to comment it. In this function, I'm going to create a variety of variables that will only be meaningful at this moment. Then I'm retrieving them. I don't need to create variables that exist always. By creating variables outside of a function, right? some of the first things we did, by creating these variables right away, these exist always and we can use them always, and they take up memory always. But when we have variables created in a function, they only exist for the time the function is running. So in this function, prep comics, I want to create some variables that will only exist for the moment that I need them. So we're going to create dollar val in title equals the value of the input field title, which we get from the jQuery selector. We called it in title. No pound sign. Very important. Pound sign. Document that get element by ID. ID. The name of the ID. At the very end of that dot val. The jQuery method to check what is the value currently written in the input field title store it in the val, the value, in title variable. So way up at the top, these IDs, this idea of in title is <coughs> being found by the jQuery selector. We check its value and we store it in a variable. We will do that for the other fields as well. So this will be tedious, but it'll be the same thing over and over dollar val in number equals jQuery pound in number dot val comma comma at the end of all of these because we're going to create like six variables or five variables we're going to create a variable for each one of these fields one two three four five now here's a, here's a kind of cool thing with Notepad. You right-click your tab, clone to other view. You can see at the top on one view, at the top, so you can see what your, what your IDs are. And then on the other window, you can write the code. I, I forget right away what I name my things. I have to go back and forth. If I clone my view, I can, be, I can be at the part where I need to write new code and look at old code at the same time. And that's right-click the tab, clone to other view. But we named these in a way, these were named sort of hopefully in a way that is memorable, with a, with a sort of a syntax that we made up, val in year equal to dollar selector pound in year dot val the last one which is the comment semicolon and this is a case for aesthetics
we can do the console output. Obviously, this is tedious also, but it's very useful to check that we're capturing what we think we're capturing. You, you maybe never thought about it, but you can break the parentheses of your console output, your console.log, if you want. I'm just going to break it to the next line so you can read it. But you can do that now in Publisher, putting commas after each one. So now if you, if you run it, you type stuff in those boxes and click Submit. What you typed should appear in the console. So be careful here, I started the console log, open close parentheses, I close the parentheses on the second line, and I've got a comma after each variable. I type some data. I keep typing Donald Dutch for some reason. Duck. Okay, so I type some data. I click save, and then my console tells me each one without any context because I didn't write any extra string output. But I get then the data uh, in title, in year, uh, in title, in name, in year, in publisher, and in comment. Now, of course, eventually I'm going to get tired of typing real data, and it's going to be perfectly fine for you to put gibberish just to quickly get something to show. That'll be fine. But we should start to see some of that in the console. We'll do one more thing, then we'll uh, end for the day. Yes? Well, uh, let me just do this one thing, and then we're about to do the lab time. Um, all of these uh, are separate pieces of data. We want to bundle them together. Jason, what we create, what we worked with in the networks project, that was a, so a, a bundle of data in a social network. This is a bundle of data that I want to put together. And then, and then store in PouchDB. So next line, var. I could define the var up here too. I just kind of like it here because it kind of flows. Capture the data, process the data. Curly brackets because it's going to be JSON data. And we'll have key colon value. I'll break this. The one that we need is underscore ID. Um, underscore ID has to be a unique identifier. If you were going to store this data of comic books. What would you say, in your opinion uh, here, would be like the unique identifier that will separate things from other comics? The title and number. The title and number, exactly. <laughs> Mickey Mouse number 12 is different than Mickey Mouse number 11. So using the title and the number could be a 
could be a, a valid ID that is separate. There isn't anything else going to be called Mickey Mouse number 12. It's just one Mickey Mouse 12. Um, so ID is going to then be based on val in title plus val in number. No quotes because we don't need that to be a string. We need to see what's in the various. So Mickey Mouse 12 will combine to be the unique ID. Comma, because then we're going to store here quotes the title of the comic based on val in title. I also want to store the title separately if I want to retrieve it. I also want to store the number separately. But we need an ID to refer to a unique record, a unique document in our pouch database. We'll write comments in a moment. And remember, we should not write comments in a JSON file. You may be tempted to write comments over here, that's going to break the JSON syntax. If you're going to write any comments, you should write them before or after the JSON object. We'll write comments in a moment. But here we're creating a, a, uh, a variable that holds JSON data. We also have to store the year, uh, the publisher, and the comment. So we'll have year based on val in year, publisher. You could write capital letters, but lowercase is good because then you don't have to remember if you wrote uppercase or lowercase. Do spaces matter here? No. If you put uh, you know, a bunch of spaces here and stuff, that, that won't matter. If you put a space in the quotes, though, that will matter. Final one is comment, val in comment, no final comma. Console log, comic. Up here, I had the data separate, separated. Process the data as one bundle in JSON. Now it's all bundled as one object, comic. When you output that, the browser will tell you you've got an object with these IDs, these, uh, these keys, and these values. Mickey Mouse Adventures number one from 2005 from Disney. No comment. Well, I'll put a comment. Uh, valuable. Click save. The raw data on the previous line, and now object data with uh, with actual meaning. ID, unique identifier. <clears throat> I'll add some comments and then we'll wrap up for the day. Yes. Yes. Um, it works because yeah, we're in the script. We're in the JavaScript block, which happens to be in an HTML file. So that is valid. This JSON is JavaScript object notation. Not yeah, exactly. If you write it outside of the script block, it, it won't understand it. So this first part here is uh, gather the values of the input fields. This one here, uh, bundle the data in JSON format for pouch db 
we must have an ID underscore ID field. Everything else is completely optional. We can make it up however we want. We need an underscore ID, something that will be unique. The examples on pouchdb.com used an email. Think about when you sign up for a social network. I'm trying to sign up with an email that's already been used, so I can't use that email. That's the unique identifier in that network. I'm going to tell you right now, this is actually not the best way to do it, but for the moment we'll do it like this, and when we come back next time we'll do it the better way. But we need some identifier, unique identifier, for that ID. We'll do it better next time. And this is the code so far. I'm going to put the code in the folder in a moment. But we started to work with the database that will eventually be integrated into our Visual Studio CBDB project. We're doing it out in Notepad, out on its own, so that we're not distracted with the overhead of a, of a big old editor. Once this works, we'll drop it into our main project. And we're reusing the concepts of JSON with a new database, PouchDB which we see the benefits of. Simplicity, using the same syntax. Other databases have other syntax. If you're using MySQL, you have to write the commands to get the data and such and save the data in a completely different way. Here we're using familiar JavaScript <coughs> commands to eventually put the data, get the data, delete the data, but that we're still preparing our data. And that's what this whole function is doing here. One last thing for this function after that console output, after we've processed this data, return comic out to the larger world of the of the of the program. It technically only exists in this world. Create the variable comic. Let's get that data out of this function so we can use it elsewhere. Return the data from comic. So that's it for the moment. Uh, let's have a little lab time, and um, we'll continue this on Thursday.